Hello, Acadiana, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the TV series From Chains to Change. My name is Marcus Simmons, better known as Chachi, and I am a Lafayette organizer for Voice of the Experience, better known as Vote. I'm joined here with my co-workers and colleagues, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello everyone, I'm Consuela Gaines, also known as Sway. I too am a chapter organizer for Voice of the Experience, better known as Vote. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Matthew Green. I'm, I'm a professor at UL Lafayette. I'm also a member policy coordinator with uh, the Vote Lafayette chapter, um, and I'm excited to be here. Hello Acadiana, my name is Alona Prieto. I'm the director of organizing for Vote. Really excited to be here visiting from New Orleans. Okay, again, thank you guys for joining us. And today our topic is going to basically be our coworker um, and colleague giving their story of self. And I'll pass it on to Matt. All right. Um, so we have the very fortunate pleasure of having Ms. Alona Prieto, Director of Organizing for Vote, here with us today. So we are going to ask some questions and talk about organizing, what organizing is, what our stories are, how we're involved, um, but also a little bit about how we all came to be involved with Vote. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am curious if you could give us a little bit of backstory about what brought you to vote? We all have a unique story about how we got here, how we got involved in this work. Mm -hmm. What brought you to vote? So what brought me to vote is I found myself in a space of being kind of in a career change path. And um, I had known Norris for a very long time. We worked together over 20 years ago as a juvenile justice project of Louisiana. Um, and vote was going to sue the state of Louisiana for voting rights to reenfranchise people who had felony convictions um, to get the right to vote back. And so Nora said, come on and volunteer for us. And I said, I don't know anything about voting rights. And he said, come on. And that was the beginning of the end and I haven't left since. It's been seven and a half years. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. yeah. That's wonderful. How did you start getting involved in criminal justice work, criminal justice reform work? Um, I know vote, from knowing you, I know vote wasn't your first stop no. here. So how did, <laughs> what brought you down the path that ended up leading you to being involved with vote? Yeah, vote. Um, I was in, I went to law school in the late 90s. Um, and I was really, it was kind of at a moment in my life where um, I was struggling to kind of find my way and so I knew I wanted to go to law school but I didn't really know why and um, I was fortunate enough to go to American University in Washington DC which is a very competitive space to be in. Um, I was also recently on the heels of you know the death of a family member that was very very close to me so I think my struggle was partially still kind of dealing with grief um, and my grades were not the typical straight A's that I was used to getting, which is not really a good space to be in when you're in a competitive space like Washington, D.C. So I ended up um, volunteering for the summer at the Prisoner's Rights Project, which was the D.C. jail at the time. Um, doesn't exist anymore, um, but the reason I went there is because my grades weren't really good, I was kind of lost, um, and that was the kind of beginning of my journey of figuring out my purpose and finding my way. That, you know, uh, I know I've been working with you for for a while now, yep. since since being here at Vote, 
and I've learned so much from you. Um, and it's, it's really helped me to polish my organizing skills. <laughs> and the thing that we encounter a lot is people who aren't directly impacted, mm -hmm. they don't always feel comfortable in this space at vote. Yeah. So how, how were you able to find your niche and really get into everything that vote is doing even though you may not necessarily be directly impacted? Yep, so I wasn't directly impacted in that I had never been to jail before other than through work. Um, my son's father went to jail for three years. Um, it was a very kind of different circumstance. Um, I also didn't grow up proximate to incarceration. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in New Jersey in an area that many know kind of from TV as the Jersey Shore, but that's not at all what it is. <laughs> it's a really beautiful space. Um, I was really fortunate to grow up there in a town connected kind of adjacent to the Jersey Shore, um, but there were no folks of color there. Um, you know, crime didn't actually happen in our community. Those were really reserved for spaces like Newark or Camden outside of Philadelphia. And so, you know, none of that was actually my, my world. And I think like the bigger question is the why you end up doing this work, not necessarily kind of being comfortable, even not necessarily being proximate. And I think we all have experiences in our life or some kind of value that, you know, we're taught. And for me, when I went to the DC jail to volunteer is where I started to kind of figure out what my purpose was. Um, like I said, I had lost my uncle, who was somebody that I grew up with. He was only three years older than me. Um, I, my mom had me really, really young, and my grandmother had him <laughs> really, really late. But we were inseparable and grew up together, um, but we really grew up in two very, very different worlds. And I think every time in my journey along the way to vote, figuring out some point in time where the world just didn't make sense to me really kind of takes me back you know, to that childhood space of living two completely different lives where I was raised to think that no matter what I wanted to be, if I wanted to be a lawyer, I could be a lawyer, but that mm -hmm. wasn't uh, his circumstance, that wasn't his growing up. He had a very, really traumatic childhood, um, lots of physical abuse, um, lots of humiliation, and less than, and so even though he was my world as a kid, you kind of don't find your voice. And I think even in the whole entire trajectory and career that I've had, for me, it was being with this person who was always told that they were less than and not having the kind of life that I had. And when he died at the young age of 21, he was just finding his way. He was wow. just on his journey. And I think for me, um, in the representation that I did of young people, I was always kind of representing him to tell mm -hmm. the story of this young person has value. And when I came to vote, it was going from the very beginning of the criminal justice center a system, legal system really, to the end of it and seeing the outcome, right? I would represent kids at the beginning. And here I was on the back end seeing how challenging it was that even all this journey of long periods of mass incarceration, that people were still coming back to face, um, you know, just so much demonization in the community, right? Because you were a felon, because you were a criminal. Right. And that for right. me was just coming full circle from the very beginning of finding a voice and really trying to figure out how to teach folks who have been so impacted that they too have a voice and, and a future and can dare to have that conversation. Right, right. Well, sorry for your loss for, mm -hmm. for your uncle, um, but it's it's that relationship that you had with him mm -hmm. that just kind of paved the way for you to do this sort of work that you're doing. Yep. I see yeah. him in so many different people like along my entire life. You know, um, I see him kind of everywhere, every person who does it maybe know how loved they really are, doesn't mm -hmm. know that they have potential and that they have value or that they don't think they have a voice and can't kind of see see a future for themselves, regardless right. of what age you are. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So in hearing your story about seeing people at the start of the system, seeing people at the end of the mm -hmm. system, all the way in between, your background, um, not growing up, directly impacted by incarceration, mm -hmm. um, but now, having so many different touch points. What would what do you think in your, your journey here for vote, in vote, all of your work mm -hmm. has been the biggest challenge <laughs> faced? 
your director of organizing now, so there's obviously a lot of That's things that go on in that. But also in that, you probably have a biggest challenge that you've experienced. But then also, what do you feel is like the biggest lesson learned through those challenges? I think, um, you know, so yeah, when I started at Vote, like I said, I was working on the voting rights litigation, I had no idea what that was, but I was still wearing my lawyer hat. <laughs> and, um, you know, knowing Norris, like I do for all those years, just that you'll find your way. Um, I do remember during COVID when we were having one of our like monthly meetings, he just said, man, you found your space. And I came to really understand that there was such a huge difference from being a lawyer. Um, there's even a book about juvenile justice called No Matter How Loud I Shout. And when that title like feels, you know, when you're within the confines of the legal system, there's really very little that you can do. So the reason that I love organizing is you're really just like making a lot of friends and building relationships, but when a, a person figures out that they have a right to be heard, that they can find their own why and their own story and be brave enough to kind of get educated and learn and, and just grow, that development has some kind of magic that is really hard to describe, mm -hmm. you know, when that light bulb goes off for somebody. Um, like when we take people to the Capitol sometimes and they yeah, think, you right. know, I didn't, I don't know anything about policy. You work with people doing policy mm -hmm. all the time and they're afraid of it, yeah. right? But we make policy decisions every day about here we go, here we stay. We strategize every day to get from point A to point B. And so some of the demystifying and see people step in bravely into that power is like, it's a, so much a joy for me and a lot of kind of healing to see folks who have felt some kind of way for so long, you know, kind of make a transformation. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. And and so the where do you find your joy in in organizing or being the director of organizing? Where do you find your joy? I think I find joy in um I think I just find joy when people can really kind of, you know, when we're sharing our stories, I and mean, you all have shared your stories, mm -hmm. and then we're really looking forward to hearing from Matt. I think when people really get to that place where they're willing to dig deep, um, because at the end of the day, what connects us, whether we're impacted or not impacted, mm -hmm. is some kind of shared value, and that kind of really comes from the heart, mm -hmm. right? So I might not have the experience of being directly impacted, and I would even say that my experience as a family member of a formerly incarcerated person really doesn't isn't really kind of anything that taught me that much about it but it is when like you can connect from a human being to another human being because I think so many people who are pulled into the criminal legal system have to survive through the criminal legal system like the two of you have are just not seen as human mm -hmm. and so when you can bring that humanity back um, for me that's just I can't even really describe what that kind of feels like or for other people who aren't impacted to really understand that we are all just human beings trying to make it in this world there's something really magical about that right, right. a lot of joy for me yes um yeah i mean there are a lot of joys that we can experience you know mm -hmm. when we're like you say it's about you know connecting people bringing people together that shared values mm -hmm. you know um being able to build those relationships off of those shared values. Mm -hmm. I know for me, that's that's probably something that gives me the most joy oh, too, is those right. relationships. And then when we're able to, you know, come together mm -hmm. and join forces and, you know, use the resources that we have to make changes, man, it's beautiful. It's yeah, beautiful. the solidarity is also really, really yes. huge. I often say that vote feels like church. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's because we all come together because we all agree that this is really, really important. Yes. And that commitment to each other, even though we might not be all, we might not all be friends, we might mm -hmm. not know everything right. about each right. other, but we're still family in this way that we move as one unit. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the idea that anybody in the community can really join, whether you're directly impacted or not, to make a difference, there's something very special about that solidarity. Yes. Absolutely. You know, I've started telling everybody vote people give the best hugs. <laughs> By far and away, the best hugs are vote folks. Cool, cool, uh -huh. yeah. We have time for one more question, so I'm gonna ask you the question that um, sort of everybody's been asked at the end of their, their story of self. Mm -hmm. um, this work can be hard, mm -hmm. it can take a lot out of you, mm -hmm. it can put a lot into you. What gives you hope in doing this work? I 
think what gives me hope is that I, I really firmly believe that when people are brave enough to kind of trust themselves mm -hmm. um, and can trust each other as a community, I think that there's nothing that you can't change. And I really believe that very deeply in my soul. And I think we're all doing different organizing projects um, in each chapter that are really getting us there because it's really not necessarily the destination, it's the journey along the way. Yes. So we might not win at the end of the day, but it's, it is the power that we build. And by power, I mean the idea that we can actually achieve change. We can identify something that we find that to be really important that's gonna make our community safer, wholer, stronger, just more beautiful. Yes. And once you are able to accomplish that, I think you know that gives me hope every time. Beautiful. It does, it's beautiful. It does. But that's something that's going to have to be accomplished together. Correct. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Together. Right. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, um, Matthew Green, we would love to hear your story. What is it that brought you to vote? Um, when I first met you, you were like, you, you're a tall guy. You're number one, you're tall, and I'm tall, but mm -hmm. you're taller. So that was a plus. And just the information that you possess, mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this guy here right. knows right. a lot about a lot of different things. And to have you at Vote has been wonderful. And so we want people to hear your story, share your story. Um, and let people know how it was that you mm -hmm. came to vote and tell us why you even stay with yeah. vote. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I think my, my journey to vote started and really had nothing to do with vote. Mm. Right? I tell people that um, and they're like, huh? How, <laughs> how does that work? Um, but I think about, I think about like my life trajectory and where I started becoming aware of injustice more and more. Mm -hmm. um, I was aware of it sort of a little bit as a, as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents did a, a pretty good job of like teaching me about equality, not a lot of the hard stuff, um, but then in grad school I started learning more and more about inequality, racism, sexism, um, all the ways those are structural, systematic, mm -hmm. um, and the ways they work in the education system. Um, so for folks who don't know, um, I'm a professor of education, um, and a lot of the, the stuff that I do works around sociology of ed, um, where we look at social issues in mm -hmm. education. Um, so my first sort of awakening and sort of gaining of knowledge was around schools and how inequality was reproduced and produced in schools so that some people had an advantage, some people had a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. um, I would say what specifically brought me to vote was about eight years ago, I wasn't even in Louisiana. I was in Iowa doing a postdoc. Um, and I had met a guy um, at a local brewery and I became friends with him. Um, and then one day, you know, and when you just become friends with somebody, you, you usually only learn their first name, right? Mm -hmm. You don't learn the full name. And one day I got an email um, from him and I was like, who is this person? Do I know this person? Um, because it wasn't the name he introduced himself by, it was his full name, right? Because on your email, you get your full name. Um, and so I Googled that person to find out. And the first thing that popped up was his criminal conviction. Mm. And I thought to myself, I was like, wait, what? Um, like what I knew and who I knew didn't match what I was reading. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't anything he had told me, right? Like, and so I was like, huh. So that was probably one of my first sort of moments of sort of, I guess, recognizing people aren't just a single story. Mm -hmm. um, people aren't right. just a single thing. Mm -hmm. uh, from that, I saw the documentary 13th on Netflix, yes. um, which was <laughs> sort of eye-opening about the way mass incarceration continues to function. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, I started thinking about how this works in schools. Um, from Iowa, I came to Louisiana six years ago. So I'm not a Louisiana native. And one of the first, actually the first, my first trip here interviewing, I remember vividly driving down Camellia Boulevard here in Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And there was a chain gang out 
picking up trash right. and mowing grass. And I thought, where am I? <laughs> um, and then once I started teaching classes here, I, I brought that up to students and they were like, well, isn't that normal? And I'm like, no, this is not normal. Like this does not happen in other places. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't? It doesn't, no. Wow. Um, and my students asked me, they said, so then who cuts the grass at the schools? Who cuts the grass? I said, people you pay, people you hire to do the job. <laughs> right, right. Um, there can be state employees, they can be contractors. And I think more and more as I was, I came into Louisiana, one of the first classes I taught was classroom management. And sort of the, the more time I've been here, um, one of the things I've investigated was the school to prison pipeline. And the first class I taught was classroom management. And I started noticing student after student and person I talked to after person I talked to there was a sort of a notion, I don't I want to call it obsession, but there's a notion about people need to be punished. Mm -hmm. They need to be punished, punished, yeah. punished, punished. Yeah. Exactly. And the more I learned, the more I saw how that notion in schools is the same thing we do with prisons in Louisiana, the most incarcerated state in the right. world. Right. And I started thinking about, well, there, there are alternatives to this. And I started teaching into those alternatives. Um, Long story short, all of this stuff brought me to topic of incarceration, school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. What brought me to vote was, um, and right before we sat down to talk, I went and I looked at the first interview, I, or first email I ever sent you <laughs> saying, I want to be involved in vote. And it was an article I read about the federal government lifting the ban on formerly incarcerated incarcerated folks being able to use Pell Grants to go to college. Yes. And, and me being a university professor, I was sitting here thinking, this is a great opportunity. Um, and I'm in a position that like, I, I kept getting these pebbles sort of knocking at my window saying, mm -hmm. yeah. hey, here's a thing to do. Hey, you need to be involved in this. Hey, mm -hmm. you need to use your voice, use your knowledge. Yes. Um, There's just pebbles everywhere since moving to Louisiana that just kept saying, this is your space. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. With, um, with my wife and we went to the African American History Museum and there is a huge section there dedicated to Angola. Mm. And Didn't know that. She saw me there looking at it and she walked up to me and she said to me, so when are you gonna start getting the message? <laughs> and so it was shortly after that that I wrote Consuela an email saying I would love to get involved with VOTE um, came to the first meetings on Zoom, um, went to the Capitol, started meeting the other folks, um, came a member policy sort of, of lead and working with y'all on some trainings and things. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of what brought me to vote was that very long story of meeting a person and learning more and then being here in Louisiana and seeing stuff that just didn't sit right with me and knowing that there's a, there's a better way, there's a better possibility. Um, yeah. There's so, stuff to be changed. Right, so 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 that explains because I remember the first time I met you, it was through Zoom, and how how sincere you were. Mm -hmm. So that story explains it, right? So so Matt, so like myself, I'm an educator mm -hmm. as well, right? And um, you know, it's it's really easy um, for teachers, for educators to instead of educate, indoctrinate mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. right? Because most teachers only know what their teacher mm -hmm. taught them, right? And I'm one of those with the philosophy that a good teacher teaches the whole student, mm -hmm. right? Does yes. that, how does that sound? Yes. that sound? Right, so that's one of the things that I, that I pursue. But you know, uh, so, Teaching is one of your passions and it's your profession. So what do you actually want to mm. teach people? Because mm. it seems everywhere you go, every time I see you, you're teaching, <laughs> right? Whether you recognize yeah. it or not. Yeah. So yeah. What, what, what is the overall, um, overall thing that you're trying to teach people? It's a great question and a very hard question. Right. I would say there are two, two things. Um, one, I really enjoy highlighting untold stories 
Like, what are the stories that are not being told, not being shared? Um, who right. are the people that are being marginalized? Right. Like, what are the things that people don't realize about how the world works or how education works? Um, and then that leads into number two. I really like changing how people see the world or even see people, right? Like, we talk about this with Vote all the time. and and. The person I told you about at the beginning of this, my, the guy that I became friends with, I'm still friends with, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think changing people's perspectives about how they see systems, how they see people, how they see laws, how they see their own capacity to right. affect change and sort of flipping that light bulb sort of in them, to, that's not even, that's not just up here, but it's also right. like also in here, but then also I've, I've started thinking about it, right? Like it's like, it's here, it's here, but then it's also in their feet, like something that gets them to move, to move. Right. Yeah. something okay. that gets you to move. Yes. And when I think about what I want to teach people, it's those three things. And it's always around sort of inequality in education, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm an educator who teaches teachers and I work with people about sort of education and social justice education. Mm -hmm. When I think about vote, I think about how many people don't realize what is happening. They don't know because right. those stories have been stifled, right? right? Those right. stories, mm -hmm. we have a lot of stories about why people deserve to go to jail or why people deserve to go to prison. We don't have alternate stories. Um, and so people stick with those. Uh, and I think one of the, the things that when you ask me that, I think about is I, um, taught a social studies methods class for our teachers, people who are gonna be teachers at LSUE in Eunice. You know Eunice, you know Eunice. That's my town, um, that's where I grew up from. Right, Eunice <laughs> is rural Louisiana. Yes, very. And I asked them, we, we did a project and um, it was around a social action project where they had to start identifying issues in their communities. What were some of the problems? What were the things that they were seeing? And what this led into was the recognition that the things that they were seeing are the same things that the people in cities are seeing, people in New Orleans are seeing, right. that lead to mass incarceration. Right. They were needing educational opportunities, economic opportunities, healthcare opportunities, mental health opportunities, substance abuse help. Um, and so for these people that may not have been aware of how sort of impacted or how they how their communities are also touched um, by injustice mm -hmm. I think that's something sort of like getting people to realize oh there there is a commonality in this work and that mm -hmm. it's not just looking like a certain person or in a certain place right, right. it's everywhere <laughs> well I want to I want to thank you man because I know how hard it is especially see because the world understands why we're involved, right? But for people that is not just as involved, I know family members and friends can be like, hold up, you know, can choose a side mm -hmm. that you're not on, you know, against you because, you know, you working with these mm -hmm. people and these people are criminals, they're, they're, they're ruining our world, you know, because that's the mentality. Yep. So I'd like to thank you for your bravery, you, the Salon as well, and um, just thank you for everything, man. Welcome back to From Chains to Change. Um, one of the reasons that we share our stories is that it's important to know what brings people to vote why they're involved. Um, storytelling is a, is a really important part of organizing with folks. We have our director of organizing with us here today, um, Ms. Elona Prieto. And once upon a time, you told me organizing is about shifting power. What do you mean by that? Right, so I think a lot of times when we talk about power, people get really afraid and they think it's something to be wielded. And really power just means the ability to do something. Um, and so when we talk about shifting power, it's really that community comes together to identify a challenge that they're facing. Because at the end of the day, those closest to the problem know the solutions to the problem that they have. And so when we say shifting power, it's finding those resources within a community to get the change that it is that you're seeking. And so when we talk about resources, same thing, that doesn't necessarily mean money. 
That means right. the ability to share your time, which is your most precious resource. Right. Right. It is your creativity. It is your things that don't actually cost money. Somebody who's really willing to kind of dig deep and share their story, like right. that becomes a resource because our stories help shift the narrative and help other people understand what the problem is that we're trying to change. And so that can be anything. It could be, you know, you need a street light on your community or it could be ending mass incarceration, right? <laughs> and everything in between. Right, it just right. depends. And so for us, you know, leadership and organizing as organizers, as members of VOTE, mm -hmm. right? We make that commitment to work together um, because we are enabling other people to achieve the change they wanna see in uncertain circumstances. Because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, we never know if we're gonna win <laughs> what the really end destination is, but it's really about the journey. Right, right. And we talk about storytelling, and we've been talking about storytelling for, for a while, mm -hmm. and the importance of it. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't know how to tell my story. How can I tell my story? And that's something that we're training our members how to do right here at Vote with storytelling training or public narrative. Yeah. And so I know I know you're you're really huge on <laughs> making sure that all our members know how to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. Could you go a little bit more into the storytelling sure. aspect so people can have a better understanding and not be so afraid yeah to tell their story. Yep. I think what's really important to understand about storytelling is if you don't tell your story, somebody else is gonna tell right. it for you. <laughs> yes. And the way they tell that story, right? And yes. so, and I think, you know, storytelling isn't rocket science, it's just really kind of getting to the heart of, you know, something that connects another human being to, to another person, right? We find our humanity. And I think, you know, people need to remember that we tell stories all the time, mm -hmm. right? So if we're having a conversation when we build friendships, we tell stories about yeah, an experience that happened. So it's no different, I think. It just gets a little bit more challenging because you're identifying why this issue might be important to you. And it can be, you know, sometimes there's trauma um, right. in there for people. Sometimes it's, it could be just absolute joy. But mm -hmm. to really put yourself out there means that you're being vulnerable. <laughs> and yes, the last yes. thing... Any of us really want to be as vulnerable right, right. because it's, you know, kind of getting over that fear. But as organizers, we also use our stories for people who are afraid, you know, to bring fear, for people who are alone to bring solidarity, mm -hmm. um, to bring love, to bring hope, to kind of shift those states that really often keep people in communities that are impacted stuck where they are, right? right? Apathy. Um, I think, you know, as human beings, we all kind of need to figure out why we want to engage in a particular activity. So we can sit and watch the news and say, that's terrible. <laughs> but at what point are you going to kind of make a choice to be the change that you want to see um, just in your community overall? And the, the storytelling is, you know, really, I think the thing that's scariest for people is the vulnerability. And so yeah. once you kind of can understand, um, you know, how to tell your story, it can really be life changing. Right. And and so even with, even with the storytelling, um, where do people tell their stories? At the Capitol, or I mean, where, where, where can these stories be the most impactful? Stories for me are become the most impactful, not necessarily at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. I think they become the most impactful because they're the thing that help us build relationships. Mm -hmm. So if I want to get to know Marcus, we're gonna have to share a little bit something about each other mm -hmm. because we're never gonna get to a point where we right. can trust each other. Right. Right. Um, and I can know that if the two of right. us want to create a change or we want to do this thing, like go to the Capitol, mm -hmm. meet our legislator. Maybe Marcus and I have the same legislator, but we don't really think that um, you know that person is somebody that we can talk to, but we're mm -hmm. committed to, to figuring out who our legislator is and we're gonna go talk to, to that person, right? We're engaged on a particular journey to do a thing. And so for me, it can be incredibly powerful to tell your story at the legislator. Legislature, I think it's really powerful to tell your stories um, to the media, to each other, but I honestly think the most powerful place is when you're building relationships. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. from that is like the beginning of the journey. 
and it's not really an organizing. We're not talking about their relationship that's all in your business. Right. <laughs> if right. you become friends as a result mm -hmm. of it, you right. know, that's great. But if you think about, you know, the civil rights movement, that solidarity came because people all were vulnerable together. They found hope together. They found joy together. Um, it was a civic, it was a public relationship that we're creating. Right. And I think at Vote, that's really what we're striving for is for community to come together. Um, right. So the, right. you know, the, the, the land yap that comes is the friendship mm -hmm. and the love, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is speak up for ourselves as a community. Right, right. right. So, so prime example of what you're illustrating there is, um, so, so over at the college where I teach, my one of my best friend is the the high set teacher GED, mm -hmm. and um, you know we're completely we completely opposite. He's from up north. <laughs> He's from up north, and he he tells the story about how David Duke was his neighbor, wow. right? And I'm down here, and and you know just uh -huh. as involved person, so we're on the same campus, and from a distance, you know, we see each other, <laughs> and so we had no idea that that a friendship, a true friendship between the two of us, would have evolved from just aging our acquaintance by telling a story, mm -hmm. right? And that story resulted in, into us writing a book together. Mm. And we had no idea that, that we thought so much alike mm -hmm. and never would have if we wouldn't have been willing to share our story. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's sharing the experience. I think that's generally kind of where we are right now yeah. as human beings is we can't kind of hear each other because we can't really feel each other and until we can really be open to the possibility that we might right. not see eye to eye right. but there might be things that we actually share and care about together right. um, mm -hmm. is really the space that we need to be in um, I think kind of all over but particularly here in Lafayette. So you mentioned the importance of relationships mm -hmm. um, and vote is a little different than some other criminal justice reform Nonprofits organizations. Yeah, just um, it was started by incarcerated individuals, mm -hmm. then create by formerly incarcerated individuals, and formerly incarcerated individuals play a large role. What is the importance of that role in this work and in organizing work mm -hmm. and in sort of the story of vote? Yeah. I think, you know, because Vote was started by currently incarcerated people who are now formally incarcerated, I think, you know, we see it a lot when we are out in the community when we got Act 636 passed that re-enfranchised so many people, mm -hmm. even if they weren't incarcerated but had felony convictions prevented them from, you know, actually being able to be civically engaged. Some of those people for like 30 years had actually been eligible to vote but didn't know it. And so it is really important for formerly incarcerated people to be brave enough to really share some of their experience so that other people, we are the highest incarcerated state in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So think about how many people don't actually know or who might um, really just have a lot of shame and trauma from the period of incarceration, yes. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I know my um, son's father, when he came home, had a very kind of privileged re-entry, not like everybody else, right. but he still to this day has carried so much shame and humiliation. We just don't talk about it. Luke yeah. has never spoken to his dad about it. He's very sensitive to the fact that he doesn't want to, but you know, when you can see it and feel it, other formerly incarcerated people being brave enough like Consuela and Marcus to actually share their story gives another person the feeling of solidarity. I'm not alone. And so some of it's education, mm -hmm. right? The field that you're really kind of pushing because really building relationships and organizing is so that we can educate so that when we mobilize, it makes sense. Um, but people need to be brave enough to share that right. story so that right. other people can say, see themselves in that, envision right. themselves exactly. and say, I see a future for myself. Um, and I think that's the most important role I that think they can play. That's definitely one of the reasons that, that brought me to vote also, was working mm -hmm. alongside mm -hmm. with Sway and Marcus um, and building those relationships. Yeah. Um, didn't yeah. know these two people before <laughs> coming to Louisiana. Exactly. Um, yeah. But it also shows people the diversity of vote, right. the diversity right. of who's involved right. in vote, right. and how many people it takes right. to be involved yes. in this work and build this coalition. Yeah, it's really important in organizing that it's also, there's a very important role for formerly incarcerated people, for actually currently incarcerated people we work with also on the inside as an organization, so we have members on the inside uh, that we have relationships with. 
there are people who are family members who play an important role, but also people who are not impacted play an incredibly right. important role. Um, because it's going to take all of us together to have different perspectives, different experiences. That's really what kind of makes the gumbo of organizing work really, really well mm -hmm. um, and makes you stronger in the long term. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. The people that y'all see up here, you see a couple who are formerly incarcerated. You see a couple who aren't. And like Alona said, I mean, we're a diverse group. So if you're looking for an organization for you to become a part of, and we don't have membership dues or fees, we just ask people to show up and join forces with us so that we can make the changes that we want to see made in our communities and throughout the state of Louisiana in criminal justice. And, you know, a lot of people get intimidated when they see the word vote right. and think that's that's what they're about, that's the only thing they're about. No, it's not. It's just one of the things that we have under our huge umbrella of criminal justice reform. And voting is very important, yeah. but at the same time, we also emphasize um, on our rights. You know, as a whole, for formerly incarcerated people, um, from housing to employment, there are so many things, our health care, that we're working uh, so diligently and have been working for years to improve. And we've been able to make a lot of improvements. And believe you me, it, it wasn't done by uh, just the staff of VOTE. It was done by the members. It was done by the storytelling of people being able to share their stories at the Capitol, to share their stories at city council meetings, mm -hmm. to be able to use their voices. And that's what we're cultivating here at Voice of the Experience. So if you're looking for an organization where you can find your voice, I encourage you to join us at Voice of the Experience. and. We're always looking for more and more members to join us, whether you're formerly incarcerated, a family member of someone who's currently incarcerated, a friend of someone who's currently incarcerated. And that, that makes a vote, our allies, people who may not even know someone who's directly impacted, who may, you know, just have never even touched the criminal justice system you are welcome if this is something that interests you because there's a lot of injustice, especially here in Louisiana. Uh, we'll be touching on so many different topics as we move forward through this, uh, this series. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to see these guys come back and share um, some more information uh, because like Matt, He's full of information, believe you me. We have, a, we have a lot of different back. episodes planned. Oh, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And Ilona also, even though she's in New Orleans, that's not very far. So um, we, we want people to know and understand um, how they can get involved. And with Ilona as um, our director, we, we do ask people who become members. Mm -hmm. We do have a few requirements that we ask people. Could you share those requirements that we ask of folks? Yep, so we are almost growing out of our requirements. Yeah. Um, we used to require a monetary donation, but that really didn't make any sense for the type of organization that we were because it really also wasn't fair that some people could write a check and other people were doing a lot of volunteer time. So. We got rid of that and the requirements are that you attend four vote events a year, which is pretty easy to do because yeah. throughout the year, it's not just monthly meetings. Um, if you can't come to a monthly meeting, but there are other events you can attend, yeah. um, you know, we count four events a year. We ask you to volunteer for eight hours of that year. And then also, if you are eligible to register to vote, we ask that you be registered to vote because civic engagement is very important. It's an important tool that we use, but I would say it's just a tool, just like mm -hmm. changing laws and policies yes. is a tool. 
that we use to really kind of create the change we want to see. But ultimately, it's about you know making sure communities understand that they can do so. You know, anybody can come and you can find your place. We say all the time. Um, I think one of my favorite stories from Norris about the Angola Special Civics Project was if you couldn't read and you couldn't write, but you could lick a stamp, you had a place <laughs> in a like civics that. project. Yeah. And the same is true for vote, right? You don't have to have any policy experience. You do not have to actually know anything about the criminal justice system. Um, if you can, our deputy director says, if you can bake uh, cookies, the movement needs cookies too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. think of it as like all of the different skills and talents that people in our membership have. Not everybody has to have a a law degree, not everybody has to be a PhD or an educator. You just right. have to be somebody who really cares that Louisiana can make a difference and see change, um, see change in the world. That's it, that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important for people in Lafayette to know and understand about who vote is um, and what we're doing. We're, we're not asking people to step you know, outside of themselves and become something that they're not. We're just asking people to be themselves, be who you are. Right. And with the person that you are, you're more than welcome <laughs> to get in. I mean, because we have people from all walks of life as mm -hmm. members of VOTE. Right. Um, right. People with legal backgrounds, people with no legal backgrounds. You know, we have, uh, we have a great, great diverse uh, group of people and our membership is definitely growing here in Lafayette yes, and I'm excited okay. about it um, as we're seeing younger people join vote Matt you're, you're, you're one of the young ones thank you thank you for saying that <laughs> you know Matt is one of the young young uh, members and even younger than him mm -hmm. we have some members who are younger than Matthew so UL campus students you're mm -hmm. a student you're welcome I know there's a criminal justice class there, mm -hmm. and we um, try to stay connected with them as well to give them an opportunity to learn more about criminal justice from a nonprofit aspect. Because I know they, you know, they often uh, when they have those little job fairs, they have different people from law enforcement and places like that to try to recruit them. So we always show up on the set too, <laughs> so they can see um, that they can get in the nonprofit uh, realm as well instead of just law enforcement, because you know the opportunities um, to really dive deep into criminal and criminal justice is so, so broad, so broad, so broad, and there's so much work that we have to do. And it's like we won't be able to do it in a lifetime. So we definitely need young people. Yeah. <laughs> we won't be able to do it, cover it all in a lifetime. Someone once explained it to me as in social justice work is that there are many lanes in a highway. Yes. But we're all going in the same direction. Same yes. Right? Same we don't direction. all have to be in the same lane. We all don't all have to be in the same car. That's it. Um, That's it. That's actually really important because I think sometimes people might think if we're saying sharing your story, so I'm glad that you asked the question. It doesn't mean that if you join Vote, you have to go stand in front of City Hall yeah. to share right. your story. Right. There are plenty yeah. of roles to kind of play yeah. in the background plenty. that are, right. you know, quieter. If we just kind of ask that people make that commitment to want to learn and go on the journey together and wherever it takes you, it takes you to be surprised yes. where you might end up. Um, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> folks need to know that there's all kinds of work mm -hmm. that happens. It's kind of quieter work if you don't want to be the person kind of out front with the megaphone. <laughs> like, right. like, right. like, like I used to be. be. <laughs> like I used to. Y'all want to know it? Marcus is very quiet. Very, very. He's very quiet. And 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 they somehow they tricked me <laughs> into being right here. But I'm loving it because it's you know I, I, my my promise is to is to be informative, mm -hmm. and that's what it means to be informative is to be up here. Regardless of my fears, regard <laughs> I'm going to endure it because Louisiana needs this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Louisiana needs this. Yeah. And 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 to simplify everything Consuela just said, who you are is enough mm -hmm. for vote. Who you are is enough. And this might be a good time to plug in the need for outreach members, the yes. outreach committee. Definitely. Um our outreach committee is a committee that 
will be out in your neighborhood mm -hmm. um, just meeting people where they are building relationships getting people you know more information about vote but more importantly finding out what's important to you mm -hmm. finding out what's important to your community and how it is that vote can be a part of helping to make um, to get that done so um, the outreach committee be on the lookout we're always looking for people to join if you want to say it's a canvassing team if, if we'll be doing some canvassing do our, events. all of that all of that mm -hmm. so if you're looking to be a part of something like that feel free our next monthly meeting I believe they've been showing it on the screen is August 17th at the downtown convention center located at 124 South Buchanan Street right here in Lafayette Louisiana bring a friend if you don't feel comfortable coming alone. In fact, please bring a friend. <laughs> please bring a friend. And, and guess what? We always serve food. Mm -hmm. Delicious always. food. Always. <laughs> Catered food. Always. Delicious. Delicious. Right. So, so welcome back, guys. And I have one more question for Matt. Um, this, is, this is a question that everyone that sits on this set answer and I'd like to ask you Matt so what what gives you hope in mm -hmm. a time like this what gives you hope I think mentioned earlier was relationships I think the number one thing that gives me hope is people mm -hmm. um, people and community um, when I'm in relationships when I'm here with vote when I'm around people when I'm in that community um, I always feel hope it's a thing inside me right like it awakens inside me and it energizes me um, so I would say number one thing that that gives me hope is people just people everywhere and getting to know people being around people I've found that anytime there's been a social justice movement or change or inspiration people are at the core of it um, and so people give me hope Well, Lucidiana, thank you for joining us for another episode of From Chains to Change. No surrender. No, no retreat. retreat.